Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Uh, I want to introduce Josh Langston, Audrey Barker, as well as uh, Robert Jansen. I'm Tim Richardson. Uh, we have been tasked to uh, bring to you a, a talk on Recruitment 101, how to attract the young urologist to your practice. Some of the topics we'll hit on, uh, we'll go, there's a lot of data to go through, so we'll go through them fairly quickly, but the, all these slides are available for you to look back at at a different time. But we're going to look at trends in the types of different practices that young urologists are entering today. We'll look at the state of urology workforce census, as well as uh, data from the, the urologist and training uh, surveys and compare the differences between independent and employed urology practices. Uh, we'll discuss different ways that our practices can adapt to meet the needs of those young urologists. And then Audrey Barker is going to wrap it up at the end. She's got an extensive amount of experience with recruiting both in the hospital setting and the private sector. So she'll uh, have a lot of uh, key points for us at the end. So uh, next, I'll hand it off to Josh and we'll get going. Thanks, Tim. And uh, I just want to acknowledge and, and thank Tim for really putting together the framework for this talk. And uh, we are very happy to have Audrey with us. And uh, so I think we're going to move kind of quickly through some foundation um, and the lay of the land. Uh, you all know what's going on locally in your practices, but uh, we do have the ability to get a sense of what's going on nationally through the, the data from the AUA uh, census that, that's put out. Uh, and so the most recent uh, data from 2019 tells us that the number of private practice urologists is decreasing while the number of employed urologists is increasing. So now uh, in 2019, 53% of practicing urologists describe themselves as being in private practice. Um, but that's only 41% who are under 45 years of age. And that represents a 10% decline uh, over the last five years. So that leaves 46% of urologists uh, reporting employment in an institutional setting, uh, majority of which 27% were in academic hospital systems with an additional 16 being hospital employed by a non-academic hospital and 3% by the VA. So this is a, a trend line that you can see uh, with slightly different numbers, but uh, you can tell that if you're in the blue here, uh, that you're not heading in a good direction. And so we'll talk a little bit about what that is and how we might, why that is and how we could maybe change it. Uh, another trend uh, right now is some shifting demographics and that's the growing number of female urologists. So looking back just over the last five years, there's been an, uh, a net increase in 300 practicing female urologists, uh, bringing the total up to right at 10% of urologists. And this is significant for a number of reasons, um, but <clears throat> nearly uh, one in four uh, who are practicing under the age of 45 are female. So that's up to 22% and 30% of urology residents. So uh, again, the importance being mainly that female urologists are more likely to have completed a fellowship, 64% uh, of female urologists under age 45. And they're also more likely to practice in an academic setting than male counterparts, 40% uh, uh, versus 26%. So uh, another trend uh, that, that we're up against is uh, the, the increasing number who have completed fellowship training. So now that's up to uh, across all gender, 40% uh, of urologists have, have completed a fellowship as of 2019. And uh, practice support is another area in the census where we see some degree of difference between uh, practice settings. Um, and that is, uh, in one instance, uh, the ability to work with an advanced practice provider. And so 71% of urologists report working with an APP. Um, but if you look in private practice, that's only about 63% versus uh, almost 93% in academic centers. And I think as we speak a little bit more about what residents are currently experiencing as they go through training um, and, and, and why they may be more likely to, to think that they want to go into an academic practice, I think we have to take some of these practice support uh, concepts uh, in mind as well. So this is an interesting one uh, on work-life balance, and that is that 78% of employed urologists uh, feel that their job offers a better work-life balance than other, other job models, while only 41% of uh, self-employed urologists feel that their job offers a better work-life balance. So the consensus uh, here is that the majority of all of urologists believe that a better work-life balance can be achieved through an employed model. And so we have to contend with that as well and realize that, uh, that the residents and fellows who are out looking for jobs may, may have heard this uh, sort of uh, data as well. So some take home messages from the uh, census as it pertains to practicing urologists, the number of, of, of folks in private practice is shrinking fast. Uh, why is that? And if we continue to only recruit uh, residents and fellows that are, are targeted or, or interested specifically in private practice, uh, we're in trouble. 
as far as our ability to maintain our, our, uh, our, our practices. And so we have to ask ourselves, what do the employed models have uh, that attract the next generation of urologists? And can we offer some of the similar uh, benefits or, uh, in, in independent practice? Other take homes that female urologists are making up a growing percentage of our workforce in coming years. Um, and uh, with the, the demographic factors come uh, the a majority of female urologists are doing fellowships and report being strongly interested in working in an academic uh, hospital setting or under an employed model. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Robert for more discussion on what the residents and fellows uh, have to say in their aspect of the census. Josh, thank you. So yeah, I'm gonna delve into the trainee portion of the census, uh, which consisted of 415 residents across uh, all PGYs, uh, all PG years, and uh, 97 fellows who responded. Um, I'm going to try to fly through these graphs uh, and tables real quick. Uh, some of this may be repetitive from what Josh just uh, said, but takeaway from this slide is the fact that the, only about 35% of residents are considering private practice and only 10% of fellows. Uh, the others are considering either academics, uh, hospital, or military. This was broken down by gender, and again, what Josh was just alluding to, especially on the female side, is less weighted towards private practice, more so geared towards uh, academics, uh, hospitals, or an employed position. Uh, when you look at fellows, the striking statistic here is the fact that none of the female fellow respondents were considering private practice. It was either academics or hospital-based. Uh, about two-thirds of the male fellows were considering uh, academics as well. Um, the factors that influence future practice settings, the top three by far were work-life balance, uh, lifestyle, uh, geography, and compensation. Now, lifestyle and geography, interestingly, were about even across the board. Uh, when you look at um, gender, males and females, again, lifestyle, geography are the top two and pretty even. Compensation, not too far behind there. Um, and among fellows, uh, same thing. So, the recap of, of what I just showed you is basically almost half of residents and three quarters of fellows really anticipate an academic job or an employed job following training. Less than 40% of men and 25% of female residents plan on entering private practice. And as I said, none of the female fellows were considering private practice and only eight men of the respondents, which is 13% were considering that. Uh, the top three factors, which we're going to delve into in the next slides are lifestyle, uh, geography and compensation. So with lifestyle as a whole, residents and fellows favor a work-life balance over compensation. Um, and, and you have to look at the mindset of the people that are coming out of training and even the younger urologists that have just started practice. Uh, you can get into the whole debate about millennial attitudes and I don't wanna do that today. But when you look at the mindset in general, I think this generation is looking for a newer and a more efficient way of doing things, or at least asking the question, is there a better way? And this mindset can be seen as disrespectful, I think, by older urologists, but it's clearly not meant to be. There can be a gap just based on expectations. You know, what do the older urologists expect the younger urologist careers to look like? And what do the younger urologists expect their own careers to look like? And, you know, I think it's easy to see why if you consider over the last five to 10 years, the work hour decreases, there's been more of a push toward work-life balance, uh, as well as an increased push for collaboration over the last decade. Many trainees in their programs do see themselves as part of a family. Uh, there's a lot of collegiality, not just among each other, but also among their attendings. And they like to see this continue in their career. I think the days of, of independent urologists or physicians in general, uh, working really long hours, less chance to be home uh, with their families or having time for hobbies uh, is no longer seen as attractive. And again, just getting back to that mindset of, is there a better way and is there a more efficient way to do this? Uh, the call schedule comes up as a pretty common question. Uh, you know, people ask, how much call will I take? And I think that's one inherent advantage that academic programs have is you've got residents who are taking the call. As an attending, you're gonna get called rarely because the chief resident's gonna handle a lot. But as a private practice urologist, you're it, you're on your own. Uh, the topic of burnout is also looming large. This has been a hot topic for the last five to 10 years and uh, it's not immune to private practice urologists. I mean, almost half of residents report burnout, uh, about a quarter of fellows report burnout. You've got programs, academic programs and hospital systems that are putting these policies in place to try to reduce it. Uh, and it's constantly coming up for discussion. So at, when you're coming out of training, you can imagine that you don't wanna see yourself five to 10 years getting burned out. You're gonna look for a situation 
that offers a better work-life balance. As an employed urologist, you know, that's what you get. The work-life balance with set hours, days off, possibly a little more stability when it comes to income, a lot of support staff to help with paperwork. Having said that, you do have a lower income potential, a lot of red tape, bureaucracy, maybe less control over how you practice. You know, you may have quotas to meet or less decision-making with uh, equipment purchasing and, and ordering tests. Whereas as an independent urologist, that's what you get is the autonomy and the ability to run your schedule as you want, purchase equipment and make those decisions. You do have the higher income potential, which is certainly a plus, but you also have the financial risk. So um, when we look at geography, I'm gonna switch gears here real fast. Um, this is the next topic. The big, th big things with geography are family training and location. The family questions are obvious. Is the job location a good place to raise a family? Is this a place that my spouse is going to be happy uh, living? Uh, is the job location near family where we're going to have help? Uh, what school options are available and what are the reputations? I mean, these questions seem pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, with training, it is an advantage that the academic programs have uh, as a pipeline. You know, trainees may stay on staff after they finish training or they may really come to like the area and they may stay in the city or town and practice there. So I think it does behoove LUGBA practices if you have a relationship with that academic center uh, or if you have any geographic proximity uh, to try to gain some exposure, uh, try to develop a relationship uh, for recruiting purposes and for future practice growth. Uh, for location, um, interestingly, you know, when I have conversations with uh, trainees across the country, you know, one thing that comes up is, is a strong drive toward wanting to live in the city. Uh, they want to live in New York, want to live in Chicago, LA, you know, the urban lifestyle is very attractive, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, restaurants, culture. Uh, having said that, it does carry a higher cost of living and increased competition. Some of those environments can be pretty cutthroat, pretty difficult. Um, it's tough for the uh, rural practices to recruit. I think some of the biggest hindrances there maybe a lack of exposure. You don't really have rural rotations and maybe some residents do have concerns about compensation. So if you look at the table, only 3% of residents were really considering a rural setting. Um, and there are a variety of solutions out there, you know, just as an aside, government loan forgiveness may be of help here. Um, and the last consideration really is where is the job? What is the attractiveness of the location? Is it at the beach? Is it in the mountains, on a lake? Uh, things like that. For compensation, you know, more than 70% of residents and fellows expected to make somewhere between 250 and 400 a year. And educational debt is actually a major consideration here. Uh, about 50% of residents and 44% of fellows carry more than $150,000 of academic debt. And this does have an influence on where you choose to practice. Uh, less of an association among fellows, more so among the residents. Um, but the more debt you have, the higher consideration you're going to give to private practice. It also plays a role in expectations of, of uh, annual compensation. So again, the more debt you have, the more money you expect to make or that you would like to make. Now, a key point here also is that residents and fellows are not routinely educated on the private practice business model. Uh, they're not taught about buy-in opportunities, partnership tracks, you know, uh, expectations of early buy-ins. Uh, these things could be a little intimidating, uh, could be an initial hurdle during the uh, interview process and especially early in their career. So I think transparency is key when you're communicating to talk about these things, to make sure that they fully understand uh, what the lay of the land is uh, within your practice. So to recap, uh, residents and fellows really are just looking for opportunities to have a well-balanced lifestyle and they really favor that and job satisfaction uh, as opposed to rigorous hours and tough call schedules. Um, and again, this mindset may run counter to the expectations of older partners who have worked a long time, have sacrificed, have, have, have slogged it through their practice. Uh, but I do think it's an opportunity for collaboration and growth to maybe change things and look at, look at the way things have been done and say, well, could we do things more efficiently or is there a better way? Uh, geography, interestingly, is equally as important as lifestyle. So this should be considered when you're looking at your recruitment pool. Uh, and open communication when you're talking about compensation uh, is certainly important just to allay any concerns uh, regarding academic debt, uh, compensation, uh, and buy-ins. And so with that, I'm going to turn the slides over to Tim Richardson.
All right, thanks. Well, next we're going to talk about. Uh, I'll start that again because that uh, that slide flipped over too fast. Okay, thanks, uh, Robert. Uh, next, we're going to talk about things that our practices can do uh, ahead of time before we start recruiting to try to be more appealing to this uh, next generation of urologists. Uh, Robert and Josh did a great job of explaining how this generation is, is simply just much different than uh, many of us that are in practice. Uh, their wants and needs are different. And so what can we do to adapt to that? Uh, probably one of the biggest things is creation of different employment tracks uh, in private practice. It doesn't have to be the standard partnership track. That's the only thing that really existed when most of us went into practice. But that's simply not what some people are looking for today. Uh, employment with a straight salary and no partnership uh, needs to be an option or part-time employment or maybe just flexible call arrangements, um, meaning maybe someone has less compensation if they take less call. We just need to be flexible and form different pathways, uh, different employment models uh, to be ready when uh, we interview these, these applicants. Um, allow for subspecialization. Uh, Josh and Robert pointed out that, that the, a growing percentage of residents are wanting to subspecialize and going into fellowship. So we need to be able to offer that uh, if we wanna attract those, uh, those candidates. Uh, flexible options of ancillary ownership and buy-in models. This is key because one of the biggest deterrents to residents coming out today is the fear of loans, debt, financial risk, um, and seeing these large buy-ins and these expensive ancillaries is quite frightening to many of them. And that's one of the biggest things that attracts them, in my opinion, to uh, an employed model where they just simply don't have to worry about any of that stuff. stuff. And they're willing to accept lower compensation many times to, to avoid that, that risk of, of, um, of uh, ownership of all these uh, uh, ancillaries. And so be flexible and have different options that, uh, you know, not everyone has to buy into radiation maybe, or not everyone has to buy into the surgery center, but have different uh, options and flexibility uh, to, uh, to make sure that you're not scaring off uh, some of the residents in this generation. Um, start early. One of the most common uh, comments that we received around the country is that the most uh, groups started at least two years uh, before they wanted to have someone. It takes time. Most chief residents already have a job when they start their last year. Uh, and don't just look for a warm body. Be patient. Um, it, does, it does you no good to, to sign a contract with someone just to find out two years later that you guys are not a good fit for each other. And, and then you separate and you have to start all over again. So so don't just get a warm body, be patient, find someone that fits your culture of your group. Um, and then during your search, if you've, if you've been proactive and you have these uh, different uh, employment pathways and, and call pathways, et cetera, advertise that because many residents today think that private practice is an all or none thing, meaning I'm a full partner. I, I'm a, I bought into the, all the real estate. I bought into all the ancillaries. I, I took in all the financial risk. They, they think that it's all of that or nothing. And we need to advertise that uh, there, there are different pathways and there are employment opportunities in private practice that don't necessarily carry all those risks uh, that, they, uh, that they hate to think about. Uh, tips on uh, interviewing. Today, you know, we're a Zoom nation today, as you can, you know, you're sitting here watching LUGPA uh, on Zoom. Uh, the first interview doesn't have to be in person. Uh, it's very easy to have a Zoom interview with the resident to get started, just to introduce your community, introduce your practice. Uh, get to know more about the candidate. But at some point, you obviously do want to bring them in. And we encourage you to make sure that they come in for at least a couple days with their spouse. Because what residents today are looking for is they're looking for a family atmosphere. They have a family atmosphere in residency, and they want that later in their practice. So have them bring in their wife, uh, be in town for two days, give them real estate tours, let them go see the, uh, the local schools, um, give them tours of your main office and facilities and hospitals even. Um, and, and one of the big things, at least that my group does every time we bring someone in, and I think most groups probably do this, is have a nice civilized dinner with the spouses. That really encourages a family atmosphere where all the partners or as many as possible and all the spouses get together and have a nice relaxed dinner. That, that really speaks more about the culture uh, and, collegi and collegiality of the group than, than just showing numbers on a piece of paper. Um, call the references. Um, this is really important. We've had several candidates that we thought interviewed well. We called their references and found out they were just not a good fit for us. And that's much better to know right off the bat than finding out two year, after two years of employment when you have to uh, let someone go and then start all over again. 
Um, and, and if the candidate wants to come back a second time, which is extremely common, it's, it's hard to pull the trigger after just one visit, uh, don't hesitate, bring him back in. Um, and, and, and you know, usually the second visit, it's more comfortable to be transparent with all the numbers, the compensation, the ancillary, the split, uh, the call schedule, um, the overhead expenses, things like that. Um, be transparent with all of that. If you try to hide any of that, it's gonna come through loud and clear and that's gonna scare off an applicant faster than anything else you can do. Um, so be transparent throughout this um, and that, that will also help with retention, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, concerning compensation, be competitive with LUGPA practices. It's not realistic to be competitive with hospitals. We all know that they have side of service differential, that they can offer these exorbitantly high salaries for the first year or two uh, before they renegotiate the contract and then you go on an RVU based uh, uh, system. Uh, so we know that the, the starting salaries of hospitals are high. You can't compete with that. Don't try to. Um, and feel free to point out to the applicants, look, you see these high numbers at hospitals, but here's what happens at year one and year two. It gets cut, you go on an RVU contract, whereas in private practice, you're starting with the salary, but typically it's going to do nothing but go up once you buy into things and become partner. Uh, call compensation. This is a big sell. Many of us get paid for taking call, um, and, and this can be a big sell. I mean, just getting paid takes a little bit of the sting out of taking call and, and uh, makes, uh, makes it a little bit more palatable for those uh, applicants. Uh, moving expenses, signing bonuses, and stipends. This is something that a lot of groups do. It's certainly something that all the hospitals and academic centers oftentimes do. Um, but, but consider uh, offering moving expenses and signing bonus uh, and offering stipends. And, and also I'd point out that many hospital systems will offer stipends to residents uh, for two to three years, as long as they go to a, a community uh, and practice where they have a facility. So reach out to the hospitals in your location to see if they have a stipend program. Uh, for instance, the last three partners that joined my group all had uh, great stipends from HCA Hospital uh, before they came. And that was part of the reason they ended up uh, uh, in our community. So uh, reach out to your hospitals to inquire about that. And again, as far as retention, the two, the two big things are transparency and, and culture. Just be patient, find someone that fits the culture of your group, the personality of your group, the work ethic of your group, um, and be transparent throughout the whole thing. Don't hide anything. Uh, there, there should be nothing to hide if, if this person is going to become your partner. Um, and if you try to hide it, they're going to see it and, and it's going to make them run. Um, and I, I also highly recommend a thorough group discussion with a formal vote, you know, just, just like you would about purchasing large equipment or real estate, a, a formal vote uh, on, on the candidates. Because if you get in a situation where half the group is a little wishy-washy, that, that's never going to, you know, it may not be worth pulling the trigger. That's never going to end up being a, a good thing. So some of the questions we tossed around the country just to kind of stimulate some conversation. Uh, what have been your biggest hurdles in recruiting? Well, the, the number one resounding answer was it just doesn't feel like there's enough candidates out there. Um, it, this is especially true for rural urology. Um, you know, uh, Robert touched on the point that uh, only 20% of residents have exposure to rural urology, but 50% would admit that if they did, they would consider going into rural urology. Um, so try to overcome that with with getting to know your local residency programs, going to meetings, going to conferences, introducing yourself to the residents, um, offering mini rotations to the residency programs to, to send the residents to your group for you know, two to four weeks to get to know rural urology or just uh, private practice urology. Um, so get to know um, the residents and the residency programs in, in the general area of your country. And, and that can go a long ways with, uh, with identifying candidates. Uh, what are some of the most common reasons you've lost a candidate or a partner? Uh, one group said, well, we lost a candidate to an academic hospital due to career goals. Um, so is it possible that if there was more of a conversation and transparency about what that urologist wanted for their career and what the group expected for their partner, is it possible that situation could have been avoided? Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's always possible. So again, transparency and communication and find that right fit. And then family and salary have also been uh, common reasons. Uh, we, we've talked about it several times. A, a work-life balance is what's most important to this next generation of urologists. It's not making a ton of money. So if we, if, we, if we say, look, you can work your butt off and make a ton of money, that's gonna chase a lot of people off. Um, so, um, so make sure that we have different models to offer that work-life balance. And then what tools have you used in recruiting? Well, most people use LUGPA, AUA, the AUA job finder, et cetera. 
Uh, but I would also, um, you know, encourage people to uh, get involved with uh, LUGPA Rising Chief Resident Summit and Job Fair. This is gaining a lot of traction thanks to social media uh, with residents today. Uh, this is gaining more and more popularity and more and more people know about it. Um, and it's been successful for the last couple of years. So, um, so I would, you know, I encourage you to get involved with that. And, but the number one thing that every group said was their most successful practice is, is word of mouth and, and contact, you know, personal contact. So get in touch with, with people, you know, at programs, get in touch with residents, you know, um, you know, start putting out feelers two to three years ahead of time, offer to bring them in with their wife. Uh, it'd be surprised, you'd be surprised at how many people um, you would find interested when you reach out to them. Uh, what have been some of your most successful and worst methods? Um, again, most successful is word of mouth and local contacts. Um, recruiting local residents in their residency has been our main model. This, this is, these have been the most successful things that groups have said uh, throughout the country. Specifically, when dealing with uh, recruiting a female, what has worked? Um, some groups said, you know, we've been very successful. We have, you know, one group said we have five uh, female urologists employed. And, and they, they made a point to say, look, it was, it was really important to already have a maternity policy in place and also have different employment tracks available. Um, you know, if you don't have that in place and you're trying to figure it out during the interview process, they're, they're gone. If you are proactive and you have these different employment models in track, maternity policies, et cetera, um, it, it's a great selling point, especially to the uh, females coming out into practice. Uh, what kind of financial assistance or loan repayment options do you offer? Uh, one group said we, we do offer stipends up to $50,000, uh, depending on the quality of the candidate. Uh, signing bonuses is a common, common thing. A lot of groups would just consider an advancement on their salary. Uh, some groups actu actually offer a legitimate signing bonus that's not uh, taken from their salary. Uh, and again, uh, I would reach out to the hospital systems because there are a lot of hospital systems that offer um, big national hospital systems that offer stipends to residents as long as they practice uh, in, an, uh, in a community that has a facility uh, that they own. I've experienced that in two different cities that I've, that I've practiced in. So I think it's more common than we realize. And then do you offer different employment tracks, uh, you know, other than typical partnership tracks? Um, one group said we have a senior employment model, but we don't have anything in place for the younger urologist. But pretty much every group said we're looking into that. We realize we need to do that and we need to come up with something uh, that does that. And then uh, one group said, yes, uh, we have a part-time employment uh, uh, tract and that's been extremely successful in uh, allowing us to get a female urologist. Uh, they, had, they just hired a female urologist that works three days a week, gets paid accordingly and both parties are extremely happy. And again, if they didn't have that in place uh, when they interviewed the candidate, she'd likely go somewhere else, whether it be hospital or academic uh, setting. Um, so, so be proactive and get these things in place before the uh, recruitment begins. So uh, we're very lucky to have Audrey Barker here. We're going to let her uh, go into more detail on different things we can do and, and just what the mindset of, of this uh, generation of urologists is. She has a vast amount of experience uh, in the hospital sector as well as the private sector. She's currently with uh, Central, Central Ohio Urology Group, um, and we're very lucky to have her. So I'll turn it over to Audrey. Thank you, I appreciate it, Tim. Um, thank you for the introduction as well. And just as a recap, my name is Audrey Barker. I am the Vice President of Physician Recruitment for uh, Central Ohio Urology Group. We are a uh, private equity backed, um, large private uh, urology group with US Urology. And um, I came in on December of, of coming up on a year, December of 2019, um, from the efforts of my group, kind of realizing that they were able to recruit about 90% and they were losing those candidates in that last 10% push to get to the, the end game there of finding the position. So um, US Urology provided an afforded opportunity for my group to bring in a vice president of physician recruitment that really and truly has laser focus on the efforts of physician recruitment, succession planning, and retention as well, and really doing a deep dive into uh, the young physician, the residents, and um, educating and, and really just being that pillar of support for private groups to um, ultimately get some of that talent from our talent pool. So, um,
I came from a very large system in Southwest Ohio that was a hospital employed system. Um, we had nine hospitals. We had, before we had an employed group of 500 physicians with multiple specialties, we to Tim's point actually utilized the private groups in town for our urological needs. So um, while the hospital system utilized a uh, recruitment agreement through like a salary subsidized guarantee um, with stipends to uh, Tim's point, we um, then kind of converted to hospital employment mode and I recruited for urology for nine years built that group up to nine physicians, and then ultimately was recruited out after 13 years to join Central Ohio Urology. But during that time, I did get exposure to helping our private groups in town, but also developing the employed model. And what you'll see if, if you're ever in the market for a physician recruiter of any type, uh, we recruiters kind of cut our teeth from being employed by the hospital systems. You know, they're the institutions that can afford the, the in-house physician recruiter, we have a, a, a true pulse on the community where we are recruiting as opposed to an outside firm. So there's really great opportunities there that um, you all may want to consider as you're thinking, how could we really set ourselves apart from other um, practices that um, might be struggling or in the same boat? So a review of the key issues and concerns, of course, the physician shortage. We are having retiring physicians, the aging physician population, and our programs aren't growing. There's no new seats in uh, the match programs or the residencies, so we are left with a smaller pool of candidates. And to um, the group's point, a lot of physicians, these uh, millennial physicians, are wanting this hardcore work-life balance that is different from a lot of the experiences of the physicians of the past. And uh, we're, we're looking to kind of develop a new way of practicing medicine that's going to appeal to these uh, residents. In addition to that, you guys are playing the role of recruiter, too, a lot of times. So, um, you know, you have your clinical demands, the capacity of your call and your, your own work-life balance. And, and then with COVID-19 coming into play and everything kind of moving to virtual, it really is keeping our, our physicians from really having that true outreach and um, less scratching their heads with, with where is the extra time to do this recruiting and, and give it the time and attention that it truly needs. Um, the competition against the larger institutions, I wholeheartedly believe that we are at um, a better location um, competitive wise than the larger institutions. You know, I, I feel like they all but put things on hold when COVID happened. They have the more layers of decision-making, more bureaucracy, they move at a glacial pace. So now is the time to really strike while the iron is hot and take advantage of that nimble uh, position that we're in with the um, you know, fewer levels to make these key decisions based on compensation or um, physician fit and recruitment aspects to get those positions landed quicker and um, sooner in their training program. What I'm also seeing are these physicians, if they're prepared, um, be ready to make them an offer early on in their training and to Tim's point, get creative and, and to Robert's point um, about the offers and the stipends that you could pay them during their training that could entice them to sign early. If they're ready to make a decision and we can get them off the market earlier, why not? Um, the new type of physician, okay, so we've talked about this, this millennial. I, I joke that gone are the Norman Rockwell physicians that slept on the couch in the office and didn't see their family and, and took out loans to keep their own practice afloat. So that is a, a thing of the past. And sometimes it is harder for our groups to kind of reconcile that because we do have some of those older physicians that are seeing these, these offers come out that are so um, starkly different from how they came into practice and, and how they really um, earn their livelihood as, as they were um, de developing their clinic and, and their own practice and, and word of mouth. And then um, their spouse and family is important as well. And I think this is one of the most important aspects that we really lose sight on because from day one, um, when, when I talk with physicians, I, um, you know, you volunteer without, you know, going into the HR infractions of asking if they're married or if they have a spouse or kids or whatnot. 
um, you can have this natural dialogue that's going to volunteer their personal information and where you will have that available and you'll know what their key drivers are and what's really important and to what degree that spouse is wanting to be involved in the decision making, um, if there's extended family, if there's children involved, and it really gets into the minutia of checking all the boxes for that family. Um, as a physician recruiter, I am working with local daycares to find the best daycare programs, looking at the Ohio Department of Education to figure out what the top percentiles of the school districts are so I can provide a list of the best school systems for families with young children in schools. You're finding religious um, affiliated churches and mosques and all of those areas and asking the spouse what kind of hobbies they're interested in and, and doing that research ahead of time. So when the physicians do come out and you are hosting them for a visit um, to the group's point when they visit, go that extra mile of buying some tickets to an event that they really um, enjoy or that you've learned from talking to them. Uh, and then lastly, penetrating the residency programs. So programs outside of your immediate area, don't forget the, the aspect of the match where I am from Ohio, but I might have found my, my great match opportunity in Iowa or Utah or California, but I have full intention of coming back to Ohio. So while we want to um, hone in on the local programs, just because that's kind of the low hanging fruit, um, connected geographically to our own practices, um, always be willing to reach out to those residency coordinators and ask if there's anybody that went to medical school in your state or um, are originally from your state. And that might really uncover some additional candidate pools that you might not have considered before. The millennial physician. So I, I profile and characterize them as this high need for safety. So um, the baby boomer population, I think some or most of some of us have these helicopter moms and dads that wanted to provide the best opportunity for us. And thusly, they had this, this huge kind of safety net that protected them all through their, their um, adolescence and, and childhood and, and rearing. And now we've got um, kind of this coddling effect where they're slow to make decisions. They've not been expected to kind of negotiate these these huge employment contracts or their, their huge first career opportunity, it's very daunting to them. And um, again, to the point of work-life balance, they, they are training with physician extenders. They're used to seeing this, um, this balance in their training and they're wanting to mimic that. So how can we get creative and offer that to these residents as a continuum of what they're experiencing in their training? So while I'm interviewing with candidates, it's great in that um, I joke I'm kind of a chameleon. So I am going to take on any kind of personality or um, uh, approach, or I'm going to profile the candidate, if you will. There are these six top personal needs that you can pretty much identify and you can characterize yourself too as you're trying to see where you might fall in. And everybody has three high needs and three low needs. And um, they are safety. So you've got those individuals who want to av avoid risk at all costs. So um, those are the millennial physicians. You've got order, an environment that is organized. You've got those physicians that maybe stay late to close out their charts because they want to come into an organized environment the next day. Um, their, their charting, their dictation, it's all very um, cohesive and concise and, and they're dotting their I's and crossing their T's. Um, you've got the achievement individual who likes to get things done. This is the box checker. This is, you write down everything you want to do. You love checking off the box and saying, okay, I got that done. And you're very task oriented. Uh, the recognition individual. So these are the praisers that really crave and feed off of that praise that they get for a job well done. Um, this is where a mentorship program would really be beneficial and come into play in a private group setting. If there are um, physicians within your group that are willing to be a mentor to these millennial physicians, I think it really goes a very long way to just help them with that safety and avoiding risk and um, just help beef them up in terms of their, um, their, their growing um, confidence in their practice and, and their abilities and what they can do. Um, you've got affiliation. So this could either be with a colleague 
uh, maybe they trained with someone and they want to continue just like um, I believe it was um, either Tim or Josh that had mentioned um, it's a family unit sometimes with these residents where they, they go where their friends and other co-residents go or the, the notoriety of the name, right? The Cleveland clinics, the, um, the large institutions that come with the name and they wanna be affiliated with the name. And then you've got the power individual, the, the image oriented, the control person. I wanna be number one. I wanna be the big fish in the small pond. Um, likely this person might not thrive in a practice of 20 to 30 physicians. If they feel like they're more of a number or um, somebody that might have to grow up through the ranks before they can get that um, control and that power piece, it might not be the best fit. So you can go through here and really talking to the physician initially in those phone conversations during the candidate screening, it's gonna really play out and, and come out the way they're talking, um, the way they provide examples of what interests they have, both personally and professionally. You're gonna be able to identify their key profiling characteristics and mimic those. Um, first off, if you can mimic that personality, they're gonna be volunteering so much more information and they're gonna immediately feel um, attuned to you to where they might feel at ease. You're gonna have this instant rapport. You're going to have um, this ability to really connect with them and start to separate yourself from the other organizations that they might be interviewing with. So these are just little nuances of how to kind of play the game in the very beginning. Those really um, true in-depth conversations to the group's point, the transparency and the opportunity. You guys can talk all day long about a day in the life of what you do. I am not a clinical person and I really rely on that physician interaction um, to Tim's point, not having to do an on-site interview the very first time, but setting up two or three phone calls with the physicians and asking your, your physician group to maybe develop like a recruitment council of um, individuals that are willing to put time aside to talk with candidates, to interview them for 45 minutes, to provide feedback, back to the group on what their takeaways were from this candidate. And then you get to the actual interview and a lot of the skits have been greased where um, they might be more at ease during the interview because they've already developed those relationships at least initially with maybe a half dozen individuals, myself, maybe an executive or two and maybe a physician or two. And again, I love the quote, if you aren't speaking my language, I will not hear you. If you are a power oriented individual and I'm talking to you about um, achievement or recognition or getting things done and that's not your love language, so to speak, you're not going to hear me. So again, profiling the candidate, feeling out what their motivations are, are really gonna set you apart. And again, basic sales training, I, I joke, um, I love what I do. Uh, we are true actors. We kind of take on that persona of that candidate to really make them feel at ease. Uh, I joke, I could talk to a rock. Usually physician recruiters are these type A extrovert personalities. So, and, and the doctors sometimes aren't that. You know, you guys have these amazing clinical skills that a lot of us lack and these capabilities that where we would really partner together well and, um, feed off of each other's um, characteristics and, um, and uh, positive um, characteristics, I guess. But we do a, a great job of asking hard questions, figuring out what kind of skeletons there might be, whether it's blip, blips in employment history or um, maybe there's gaps in training or, or work or residency where we really, you know, uncovering DUIs or all sorts of interesting things can come out. So, you leave it up to us to kind of do the hard work and provide you guys that feedback and um, kind of give you a profile on paper of, of some of the things we uncovered and then to Tim's point, take it to a vote and see if these are candidates that you really want to move forward and spend that money to host them for a visit. Uh, we do the difficult negotiating. We can um, be the pillar for uh, contract negotiations. We can be the, the heavy if you need us to be the no. So you guys don't feel like you have to take that responsibility on, you don't have to burn a bridge, and it kind of keeps that option open for the future, which we'll get to um, in terms of like maybe that two to three year mark where they might be a little demystified about an opportunity that they took initially if it wasn't yours and they had a great experience and they might come back. 
So we always want to think about that too as that secondary market. And then we know where to advertise as well. If we've been in the market, we know what journals and what classified ads and what conferences and career schedules and symposiums that will really glean us the most candidate pools. Um, the group had um, great advice in terms of the Rising Chief Summit. I was able to get 75 email addresses from the residents from the Rising Chief Summit and I did a blast email and I offered these great educational seminars on exactly what um, we all know you didn't get during training. It's the contract negotiation pitfalls. It's how to conduct yourself during a site visit, what questions to ask, how to write a CV, how to negotiate student loan debt, all of these things. So um, offering just a one-on-one -on -one approach or an education session towards these residents is a great opportunity, again, for you guys to set yourselves apart. Um, what you can do is, um, you know, if, and you know this, if you provide coverage or you have a good relationship with the hospital system, utilize them and see if they'd be willing to incorporate you as a practice into the educational piece, not just the clinical rounds um, or rotations with the residents. Maybe offer to um, help pay a, a couple hundred dollars to have a physician recruiter come in and provide like a lunch and learn on some of these topics. And if they do have an employed group and they don't really want to um, have you as the competition come in and do that, you could always offer it up to the residents on your own and bring in a recruiter like myself from outside to do that. And then I have no affiliation with the hospital employee system that you might be competing with there locally, but I've got the experience in the background to provide that and really um, you know, provide the face of the group and, and again, let you guys shine. Recruiting the family, again, back to all of those great questions about the childcare, what they like to do in extracurricular activities, who's really making the decision. This will come out during um, the initial interviews, during the dinner, as you sometimes might have a high powered spouse where, um, yes, the, you know, the physician is the physician, but it might be 50 50 split on terms of the decision making. And um, if that's the case, you have to have a recruiter that's immediately ready to recruit the spouse as heavily as we are the physician themselves. And that takes a lot of a, a small village, if you will, a lot of hands on deck to really roll out the red carpet for the spouse as well. Um, and that goes to the extent of flying in extended family, maybe to help with daycare while we could get the spouse with the husband while we're interviewing. You can get really creative with how you host families to make them really feel taken care of and um, again, the red carpet feel and then continuing the red carpet. So it doesn't just stop, all this work doesn't just stop when they start. So after the interview, after the offer, after the start date, um, there's, I developed a retention metric and it's, it's brilliant in its simplicity guys. It's essentially an evergreen questionnaire that I set down or somebody from HR or a physician if you have time, but somebody in the group dedicates time and it's this um, ongoing algorithm of these key questions. It doesn't have to be long and it's the same questions every time and you're gonna have a reset or a checkpoint with your physician at start date, maybe at six months in, a year in, and maybe a year thereafter up to five years. And you're gonna ask the same questions. And essentially it's a red, yellow, and green coloring system with maybe a point value system connected to it. But it's gonna ebb and flow through those colors and tell us whether we are um, uncovering some risk factors for um, the physician leaving or not really rooting themselves in the community, or it might uncover some issues amongst the practice or the practitioners or the um, you know, the, the staff or what have you. So it's really educational to do those questions, but um, it, it continues that red carpet and that mentoring and that touch point of, we care about you, um, we wanna know how you're doing. And ultimately, if you can do that up through the five year mark, I feel like the five year mark is the goal for a family and a physician to really root in a community get acclimated, um, get settled into that community, by then they could maybe flip to be um, becoming a mentor versus the mentee. And again, the secondary market, I had kind of touched on this guys, and, 
um, the group kind of had alluded to this in terms of the hospitals offering these big salaries. And it's, it, it truly is the moon and the stars offer. And then they come off that guarantee two to three years out after their guarantee. And then they fall, they fall flat on their face because that guarantee goes away. And maybe they, um, based on some of the, the bullets below, you can see that they might've been promised a bill of goods that wasn't necessarily the case. So any, for any one of these reasons, um, you might have a secondary market of physician um, candidate pool that they have to start over. So they were, they were burned. They're, they're having an even heavier sense of safety and the need for mentorship and that transparency. And maybe they know a little bit more of the questions to ask this go around, but educating these residents early on and setting yourself apart almost completely takes that out of the equation where we prepare them to ask these difficult questions and they can make these great decisions on their own without um, feeling like they have to start all over because they made a bad decision in the beginning and they're two to three years out and they're starting from scratch all over again. So don't forget this candidate pool because um, a lot of times they, they come out and, and they're a little hurt and broken. Um, it wasn't what had been promised and we can actually come in there as kind of the knight in shining armor and offer them an opportunity and have them be completely blown away by, by the amount of transparency that we can provide and how we pay and how we compensate and how we start slow and offer these realistic compensations that we can build on. And then they eventually plateau and they create their own balance where they're happy with what their earning potential is that they're making, but also with their work-life balance at home and, and with their family as well. I know um, some individuals were asking how we can create um, some uh, mirrored or in tandem offers from employment models from larger health systems. So from my um, past 13 years with that large health system, it's not too far off guys. You've got your base salary with the one to two year guarantee. They always transition usually to some kind of RBU or production bonus structure that's indifferent to payer type. So they, you know, they see the Medicaid and those sorts of things. So it's um, indifferent to pay or tight, but it is largely influenced by geography and reimbursement rates. So those can really fluctuate based on fair market value assessments across the country. Um, one of the interesting pieces that I have a separate slide for here next is the quality metrics. Um, those are really easy ways for us to um, offer some of those stipends or bonuses to those early physicians that aren't yet prepared or ready or haven't hit their two-year mark for uh, true partnership yet in the practice. And then deep pockets. I call the, the all the extra money offerings the gravy money. It's the transition payments, the training stipend, stipend the retention payment. Um, it can be called a number of things. And at the end of the day, educating our residents to compare apples to apples and realize what's their base salary and what's extra money and what buckets are where and where they can negotiate. Um, it sets them up to really negotiate their best offers. But also for us individually as low pro practices, um, from my experience, these hospital institutions have very long forgiveness periods, up to five years, guys. So let's not be afraid of if we feel inclined or forced to offer these bonus stipends or student loan um, reconciliations that are that are large hefty sums up to a hundred or two hundred thousand. You don't have to pay it all at once. It can be lump sums over five years. That's how we did it at our large hospital institution with nine hospitals. It had five-year forgiveness periods tied to it, where if they left at any point before those five years, they would owe it back. So we can utilize that to our advantage. Where yeah, we can do apples to apples. We can offer that or go to the hospital and ask for that uh, stipend, which a lot of times they do. We did that as well for our private groups too. But again, um, there are ways in which we can be competitive and don't discount the fact that the hospitals wanna recoup all that effort too. And they're putting in these long forgiveness schedules as well that we could use in our contract. Um, and then other fringe benefits, of course, uh, getting HR involved and showing them a robust benefits package they're going to ask about CME, whether it's the same or different from vacation, if they get a CME stipend, um, and then leadership opportunities. You know, employed groups 
with hospitals don't necessarily have paid leadership opportunities. Um, they might be more volunteer or um, kind of interest-based, whether you're into, you know, IT or outreach or strategy or men's health or women's health or what have you. So I think on you know, a lot of platforms, we are comparing apples to apples. It's just more education to that regard. So they see us as an equal player um, when they're reviewing opportunities. This is, oh. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, let me, can I try to reshare it or? Um, yeah. Are you back? Can you control it? Perfect. Yep. Also, sorry guys, it's Ken just doing a time check. I think we're, we are right now at 55 minutes. Is that correct? I probably have three minutes, Ken, and I should be able to wrap up. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, no, no worries on this end. Just want to be mindful of, of, of the time. Thank you. Yeah, my last question. Do you guys want to... When do like a closing together with your cameras on or are you guys going to say something at the end? I think we were going to pop it back to Tim for closing remarks. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So this slide uh, based on the previous slide is a, a true quality metric example from a hospital institution that I helped represent. So um, these are ways in which we can help uh, provide stipends to our residents before partnership. Now, some of them you can make really easy. They can be fall out of bed and you hit these metrics. Um, some of them can be uh, static where they don't change at all. Uh, the timely closing of charts, you know, that's always going to be a metric that you want to have in your um, uh, pay for performance type criteria for bonus structure. Same thing with positive patient satisfaction scores. These could be your, your evergreen type metrics that would be easy ways to pull from your EMR that um, could help maybe provide some easy bonus structure if you're trying to find ways to bonus out your young physicians or your resident physicians. And then what they had had, the other institution that I worked with, were three additional metrics that the actual group came together and voted on. And again, they had to start somewhere. You see them. They're pretty easy. Um, they were easy to hit and easy to, to calculate. And there was an equal dollar amount associated with each metric. And essentially each quarter, um, they could get a payout of five to $10,000. They might hit 100% of one metric, 25% of another metric. And of, let's say $5,000 that was on the table that quarter, they might've hit 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000. So you can get creative with those quality metrics that hospital systems are starting to incorporate and see how you can uh, make it more individualized for your practice as well. It can change year over year, or if they're constantly hitting those metrics at 95 percentiles, you can up the game a bit, make them a little bit harder, or say these were our initial goals and now we have different goals for you to hit. So it really truly is at risk income that you want them to strive to hit at the end of the day. And again, you can bonus it at any amount you want. I've seen it from 20,000 to 75,000. However, it gets distributed and whether it's an all or nothing metric too. So there's some ways you can get creative in that. And I have some fun case studies. So one that worked, one that didn't, you can check these out, but clearly we had missed the mark totally on a candidate who was profiled immediately as a power candidate, an ego guy. Um, you'll see the, the bottom um, bullet there. He, he never really asked us about what the private equity model looked like. I think that some ego got in there where he he didn't know what he didn't know, but he didn't want us to know that. So he constantly said that he understood it, he got it, and um, this kind of predated me, but um, there was never this uh, sit down discussion. We tried to deliver the material to him and um, whether it in front of us, they, he didn't really want to take the time or, or have the humility to say, I don't necessarily understand this. Um, I think it really worked against uh, the, the whole coming together of both he as a candidate and us as a group, it really just, we could have seen the writing on the wall in that regard that um, he likely wasn't going to join us. He had always mentioned a warmer climate. He was from the Midwest. Um, they had talked about going somewhere warmer and then it kind of changed to like, well, maybe, 
you know, national road that splits the whole nation were a little bit further south. So you could count us as warmer. And it was kind of a, a, a joke, but um, had we read between the lines, we might have easily realized and saved ourselves a lot of time and effort in that candidate. And then you had candidate B that we ultimately signed and he started and has been doing really well. He was born in Ohio. He completed his residency at UC, University of Cincinnati. He had a wife who was locally from Columbus um, that we had um, courted right alongside him in terms of finding them real estate options that were local to that community and giving them um, kind of prolonged visitation time with their family while they were interviewing with us. So we, we took care of their hotel and all of that for a, an extra few days to help them really um, tie back into family when they were visiting. Um, and he was profiled again as a millennial. So we played up the safety and recognition and achievement and really ask those one-on-one -on -one broken down private equity questions. And we layered the education level after level. So when he finally signed, he had a, a really good grasp and understanding of our private equity model, what the partnership tracks looked like and what options were afforded to him early on versus after partnership and what kind of earning potential he might have as um, a private practice physician with the other ancillary options too. And then in closing, what can LUGFA do to help? Um, you know, it's, it's lobbying. It's having our physician groups go and ask about expanding our training and residency programs or discussing the methodology for the match process. It still feels antiquated to this day and it's never really changed. And um, again, being um, nimble and, and ready to hit the play button on some of these educational options that are geared directly towards residents that we as LUGPA members can uh, market is coming from us. We are subject matter experts, just like these large institutions. We can provide you real life examples and um, what, what happens in our situation and um, what we did right and what we did wrong. So we have as much knowledge to share with these young individuals as anybody else. And to get the platform to do that, I'm really encouraged. Um, I'm excited to be a part of LUGPA. These are some of the educational sessions that I've done before that I'm really getting great traction on. Feel free to reach out to me on any of these items and um, uh, we'll go from here, guys. Tim? Thanks, Audrey. Also, I wanna thank Josh uh, and Robert and Audrey for, uh, for taking part in this. Uh, we covered a lot of information. Uh, so hopefully you can look back at these slides and uh, garner some good uh, tips uh, for the future. And thank you to Lugpa Ford for sponsoring this spot uh, in the breakout session. So uh, with that, have a good conference and thank you.